It's time. It's 3 a.m. Uh, we're waiting for Lisa to say, oh, I guess we're live. Are we live? And we are. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hi. Great to be here. Hi, teachers. Hello, hello. Is it hot? Not here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, teachers, and welcome to our webinar. Hello. Right. So many wonderful people greeting us. Hello. Hi. Mm. Let's wait for a minute or two for the rest to join. How are you feeling today, right. Dot? I'm feeling good. <laughs> How about you, Sabina? Great, eager to talk about today's topic, which is going to be very, very exciting. So many right. people joined today. Oh, my God. How are they? Rowena says, super hot. Just, it's her first time here. Welcome. Hope it won't be the last time, so keep attending our webinars. I guess it depends Hello, on everyone. <laughs> That's an end. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Right. And while everybody's joining, I'm going to introduce uh, my fellow speaker today. Uh, it's Dart. He's a teaching quality assessment manager and a Novakit teacher. Happy to see you here, Dart. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm happy to see you and everyone in our webinar again. <laughs> yes, again and again. I'm Sabina Lopez, uh, lead of Teaching Quality Assessment Team, and I'm here to, um, along with Dora, talk about engagement and uh, gamification in the lesson. And if you give me a minute, or maybe less, I'm gonna, yeah, cool. So what we prepared tonight for you guys tonight or today tonight for you we hope it's going to be interesting we hope it's going to be practical and um useful and um this is our agenda for today so prepare yourselves there are going to be a lot of interesting theoretical tips on uh, student engagement in the classroom then we're going to talk about gamification and some useful tips from Dart on how to make uh, your lessons fun using games, how to make a game from a random activity, very useful. And um, as usual, at the end, we're gonna go to your Q&A session. So during the session, please post your questions in the chat box. We might be able to address some of your questions during, during the webinar, uh, however, the rest of the questions, we'll try to address them at the end. Or uh, if there's no time or no opportunity, as usually, we're going to send a post-webinar um, uh, letter to you later this week. And yeah, we're going to address the rest of the questions there. Right? Um, and one more very important thing. Uh, greet our moderator today, Lisa. She's going to be helping us behind the curtains and she's going to be collecting all the questions and posting all our questions to you guys. So thank you very much, Lisa. Hello. Hope you're doing great. So shall we, shall we proceed? Right. Um, and interesting um, a topic, actually, student engagement. Um, Dart, how do you deal with student engagement in the classroom? Um a lot of things uh, that depends on the student, right? Some some students, I use uh, games to uh, get the student engaged. I use, you know, jokes, uh, funny faces, manicam objects to keep them interested, and many other things. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas, by the way. And thank you for your opinion and for uh for this look back at your practical teaching side it's very valuable and i'm gonna use it to take our teachers to uh, have a sneak peek at student engagement uh and before i do that 
uh, I'm going to ask you guys, the teachers, uh, think about one of your previous lessons or one of your lessons today or one of your recent lessons. Pick one or, or two, the ones that you remember well. Um, from zero to five, zero being very bad and five being very good. How much did your students enjoy your lessons today? Be honest. Ooh. I'm seeing a lot of fours and fives today. That's great. I hope there's there isn't any one four point five. That's almost <laughs> four to five, says Annie. Four three. is a good number. Ooh, I saw three. I saw zero. Oh no. It's actually uh, very interesting, guys. Um Cutest to those of you who have high numbers. However, two or three happen sometimes. The question is what you do when you have a feeling that your student is not enjoying the lesson, right? Um, and another question here is, should they enjoy the learning process? Or is it okay for lessons to be a little boring sometimes, right? So school was boring sometimes. Was it bad? So here's, here's an interesting question to ask yourselves. Um, Anyway, studies show that the more your student enjoys the lesson, the better information retention. Uh, simply put, having fun and joy during the lesson helps learning. So yeah, make your student enjoy the lesson. This is the answer to the majority of the problems. Um, this was a joke. This, this is not the whole answer, but anyway, part of the problem. Um, and Let's take a quick look now at the factors that affect the learning process in terms of student engagement. And also I, I'll be sharing some nice tips on what you can do to improve that student engagement if you put A2, A3, or A1 in the chat. So here is a um, list of five factors that you basically can work with, that you can uh, change and do something to make a five student engagement out of two student engagement, for example. Um, first, I'm gonna talk uh, about student independence and how much freedom a student should have in a lesson. Um, then a very important factor of interest and how your lessons, uh, how you can make your lessons interesting to keep your students' um, attention. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk about the tips to make a task engaging and motivating, then proceed to creating a motivating classroom atmosphere and finish up to polish everything up with your teacher's role in all that process. Ready? And we're going to start with a very, very difficult question. Joking. Uh, interesting question, though. Um, how much learning freedom should your students have? What can they decide by themselves about the lesson? Um, should they decide what activities they want to do today? Or should they rely entirely on your expertise as a teacher that what do you think hmm i think it should be hmm. there should be a you know a, an aspect or parts of the lesson that the student can decide right hmm the theme maybe something not lesson breaking i guess ella says it depends on the level of the student hmm. mm, interesting right Amira says, no, both are needed. Jewel says that they can decide the color of the pen. Uh, yeah, they should be. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Josephine right. says 50%. Hmm, half the time. Good. Um, I like that our teachers are taking into consideration such things as students' level, uh, students likes their favorite color, uh, their interests, and I'm going to talk about them, about interests next. And uh, it's great to see that I would just understand that they're important. Um, as true as it is that the teacher is there because of your expertise uh, and to provide some guidance to the learning process. However, 
your students' needs and interests should be taken into consideration as well. What we really um, what we really want to achieve here is a fair balance between uh, autonomy and guidance. Uh, we want to give our students enough autonomy to make some decisions in the lesson, and at the same time, using uh, we want you we want to use our expertise to guide them through the whole process. And some useful tips here are. Uh, Basically, avoid feeding the answers. Give them some wait time. Give them a chance to demonstrate what they know. And only if you make sure that they, that they don't know something, uh, go ahead and give them the answer. Um, our students are kids. Kids are creative. Kids are lively. They love... Um, talk very much, they love, new, they love new ideas. So encourage creativity, encourage their imagination, encourage ideas. Um, if, they, uh, if they speak up, uh, tell them to say more. Why not in English, right? It's speaking practice. Um, questions are welcome. The more questions they ask, the better uh, is the outcome. The, contribution from your student is important right even if you think it's um not significant or there's these childish things it's important for them and um this will help you share uh responsibility for the lesson outcome with them because it's not only you who want the best outcome for, for the child for the student it's also them who participate in the learning process so basically you and your student should share that responsibility for organizing the learning process like fairly basically 50 50 of course taking into consideration the age and the level and, and, and everything else um interesting right so what do you think guys i'd like to ask you um again which of this do you think you're already doing very successfully? Are you good at encouraging ideas from your student? Or are you good at sharing responsibility with the student? Or are you good at allowing wait time? Let us know in the chat box. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are going to be a lot of interesting answers. Dart, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think for me, uh... That would be avoid feeding the answers, right? To try to just, you know, give them what they need to be able to answer on their own. Um, Glacy says, avoid feeding the answers. Yeah. Carla says, encouraging ideas is effective. Mm, it is, it is. Just says, if you teach a young student of four, if you notice you drink coffee and act like a young person, they love the energy. Mm, like, all right, Encour a lot of encouraging ideas. Hmm. What else? Who else? Ruena says, all except sharing responsibility. Hmm. I wonder why that's the case. Yeah, I guess the responsibility kind of um, uh, complex uh, thing which mm -hmm. consists of all that like wait time, ideas and questions and everything. It, it, and if you're already doing all of that, it means that you're sharing responsibility somehow. But anyway, um, thank you very much for your answers, guys. And uh, I'm just gonna say one more thing here that encouraging independence from your student, encouraging autonomy comes along with building learner confidence, which is extremely important for somebody who who's learning a, um, foreign language and if you're not a native english speaker you probably uh, not probably but you once you were somebody who learned a foreign foreign language and you understand how important it is to feel safe to make mistakes and feel confident um in the learning process so some tips for you guys to uh uh, practice with your students and make them a bit more confident uh about their learning uh of course it's about the feedback. Um, positive, yes. Honest, yes. Um, 
it should be really fair. Your student deserves that honesty. Um, praising good performance. Okay, maybe. Praising excellent performance. Much better. I know that many of you are great at praising. However, what should we praise? Should we praise everything that they do more or less well? Or should we praise only extraordinary things? The things that they do on a rare occasion that that required some challenge, but they achieved it finally. So probably this, this letter thing. Um, the thing is, when you use praise too uh, uh, too many too many times, it kind of loses its value, isn't it? Um, what's the point for the student to do something extraordinary if they're gonna have uh, they're gonna be praised anyway? So avoid um, over praising is another tip for you guys. Um, again, this atmosphere uh, which which you create. Uh, in the lesson should be secu secure, uh, accept your students' mistakes. They can make mistakes. Mistakes are a part of uh, the learning process and they are totally natural. Uh, maybe avoid too much of immediate correction. Maybe some not significant mistakes can be left to be corrected at the end of the activity. Um, something to think about, right? Um, okay, so reflect on your teaching guys which of this do you think you need to do more would you like to uh be more accepting of your students mistakes or would you like to avoid over praising or would you like to praise good performance more uh tell us in the chat box um what's your relationship with building learner confidence Ooh. Mary says accepting mistakes. Mm. Oh, a lot of overpraising here. It's because our teachers are best people in the world. <laughs> I think overpraising can happen when yeah, you know, it, it becomes like a verbal tick. So you just say good job. Next. Good job. Next. Yeah, mm. something to think about. Okay. A lot of overpraising. <laughs> <laughs> Told you. Right. Uh, and then I I'm happy we, uh, we kind of raised this issue and I'm happy that our teachers got a chance to reflect on what they do in the lesson and maybe uh, you guys ha will have an opportunity to change something in the future. And it's great that you're aware of that mistake. That means that 50% of the problem is solved, right? Just be aware that you do overpraising too much. And maybe uh, next time do less overpraising. <laughs> right. Um, and over to another important factor, which is uh, learner interests, likes, and hobbies, which is kind of obvious. I mean, it's it, it's obvious that the learners will be learning something um that that that's interesting for them much much better than um something that's not interesting for them but it it's not only about hobbies about likes it's also about uh, building gradually this interest and i'm going to talk um uh, uh about uh some tips that you can use in your advantage and do things right regarding uh, learner interest. Um, and learners are people. They have opinions. They uh, might agree with something. They might agree with you or might not agree with you. They might like something and dislike something else. So treat them as individual and respect their opinion. And maybe if they don't want to do some, something, take this into consideration um yeah maybe this is a, a kind of guidance that you can use in your lesson um this ties up very closely with you selecting topics and tasks which are interesting um to your student 
for example, your student is a girl who likes Barbies and not really into cars. Uh, so if you see a slide or a bunch of slides about cars, you can probably do something and shape the topic to to Barbies or maybe find them some slides with Barbies or maybe talk quickly about cars and then spend more time on slide with Barbies. Um, as, as an example, I'm not saying all the girls like Barbies, but just this, this was just my example. Um, put some effort into adapting the slides to suit your learners' needs, abilities and likes. However, have in mind uh, the lesson objectives and compulsory topic. This slide with cars might be compulsory. Uh, you will have to do it, but do it in a way that uh, maybe engages your student. And maybe you can talk about cars that Barbies use, especially in the latest movie about Barbies. Um, right. Um, and the next one is very interesting. It's about the challenge. It's about... Um, this right amount of challenge that should be in, in any activity. So it should be not easy, not too difficult, just slightly more difficult. And stay tuned, guys, because later Dart is going to talk about challenge in games as well. So, yeah, games and tasks should be slightly more challenging than uh, the basic level. Okay, and last but not least, personalize tasks to make them relevant to student students, to make them interesting, to, uh, again, if you're having a um, boy student in your classroom, maybe talking about something, uh, let's imagine they are into video games, maybe talking about some video games will interest him um, a little bit more than talking about Barbies. If he's not into Barbies, like, sorry, I'm thinking about Barbies today. Uh, I don't know why. Um, and I got some fantastic news here, guys. Uh, you're ready. Um, we are updating our student card, the student card at the moment. You've probably noticed that some of your new students from March from this month, have extra information in their student card. Um, what we basically do is we're asking parents to take a short source survey before the trial class and tell us about the kids' personalities and interests. Imagine. Um, this is what I was talking about. You can definitely use this information into uh, in your lesson to adapt the material and do whatever you want to keep the student engagement. Um, feel free to use this information as you plan how to engage a student. Um, and we know how hard can it get to uh, know the kids at the first lesson. You're going to spend some time. So hopefully now um, you have something to work with, even when even if it's a new student and you're even if you're a substitute teacher. Um, I, I have to say, this is an experimental feature. It's not available for all students now, only for those students who started in March. But it's still something, something is better than nothing. Um, please, please, please tell us what you think. Uh, the Teach Portal is usually, uh, we're gonna do the best to make it better for you and maybe upgrade it to um, uh, suit, suited best so yeah now back to our teams for engagement and the next factor is the task and you guys are going to be surprised how much the right task setting can influence how much a student will be involved and interested in the lesson um have you noticed that at some tasks your student is more engaged, the 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 their body the, their body language changed. They, they they're looking at the uh, computer. They're more involved. While in other tasks, they uh, they feel more relaxed. They feel more reluctant to talk. So there are some tasks that are interesting and other tasks that are not interesting. And the question here: uh, How do you de determine which one is which, and how do you make those 
not interesting tasks, interesting for your students. Um, it shouldn't be too easy or too difficult, as I just said, and Dart is gonna talk about that as well. Um, if it's too difficult, it's frustrating. I know I can't do it. I'm not gonna even start. If it's too easy, it's again, it's demotivating. It's not interesting. Um, I've, I've done that already. Why should I do it again? So um, it can be confusing and you always have to look for some fair balance here. Um, as you know, guys, um, the, as we work for a teaching quality assessment team, during our lesson observations, um, we see that the most successful are those teachers who adapt tasks to the needs of their students. Some of them, some of the teachers, I mean, um, skip, uh, spend less time on certain activities in order to focus on more relevant or more interesting ones. Um, other teachers uh, have in mind lesson objectives and basically focus on the slides that that that, that correspond to the lesson objectives. Um, at the same time, they adapt those slides to the students' face and um, learning styles, which we just talked um, in the factor of interest and, and, and independence. So feel free to adapt lesson material to your students' needs pace, learning style, and feel free to choose the best approach to each activity. And stay tuned again. Uh, later, that we'll talk about gamification tips for lesson activities. So here, um, it's going to be uh, extremely useful. And another tip, um, you'll be surprised how much instructions can affect motivation. Uh, clear instructions can basically uh, make any less uh, the task outcome more successful, while confusing instructions instructions can demotivate a lot. So here I'm gonna uh, ask you guys, what are your tips for clear instructions? What do you do to help your student understand the instructions and complete the task? Do you uh, keep them short? Do you prepare them beforehand? Or you do nothing and it just works that way? Tell us in the chat. What are your tips for clear instructions? Mm. Josephine says one verb, just one word. Right. Christina says to kiss, keep it short and simple. Nice. Mary, TPR, right. Paul, to model. Mm hmm. Yeah, keep it short, short instructions. Less is more. Mm. Prepare. Yep, yep. Make them simple. Use body language, says Amira. Mm hmm. Speak clearly. Yes. Demo then task. Model. Oh my right. God. So many so. nice tips. I can see that our oh. teachers are really professionals and, and keeping instructions short and yes uh, make your instructions as short and clear as possible not only will it help you make your teacher talk time shorter uh, but also it will increase the chances that the task will be completed successfully uh, and there'll be no confusion so thank you very much guys for sharing your tips um, and another good, uh, piece of good news Later this year, one of the webinars will be dedicated entirely to instructions. So all of you who, who, who were sharing such nice tips and those of you who were not, who were not feeling confident to share um, tips about instructions, come join us in one, one of our webinars um, later this year. Stay tuned. You're going to receive an announcement as usually. Um, and then I'm down to... Not yet. I'm down to um, one, two factors, actually. And both of them depend on you even more than the previous ones. Um, before I talk about this, the, the, the next factor, which is classroom atmosphere, uh, I can say that it depends on you very, very much. Almost 90% depends on you. Um, 
you create and encourage an atmosphere during the lesson and you can make it comfortable and funny or tense or stressful. So these are some tips for great classroom atmosphere, but there's something missing, the gaps. Uh, the number of gaps corresponds the number of letters. So in the chat box, can you please guess what goes in those uh, um, blanks, right? Just write full words. There are seven words. So go ahead and tell us in the chat um, what are these missing letters are, what are the words basically. I'm going to repeat for those of you who are listening, us, uh, listening to us. So A is create a mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, and mm -mm, atmosphere in the classroom. B, bring in something, something, and something. Doc, do we have any guess, any right guesses? Try to answer in one message. Oh, we have here. Gerald says, pleasant, calm, secure, organized humor, laughter, and secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that last one didn't land. <laughs> okay. Who else? Roxanne? Pleasant, Did somebody calm, guess order. seven? Oh, do, do you have it? All oh, in one message. Is it Pamela? Pleasant, calm, secure, organized humor, laughter, smile. Do we oh have my God. a winner? It's, it's, it's not the contest yet. It's, gonna, it's coming. It was actually a spoiler, guys. Next one is going to be a context, a contest for you, but not, not that one. This is a, um, a rehearsal. But then thanks to all of you who guessed the right answers. Uh, the right answers are um, A, create a pleasant, calm, secure, and ordered atmosphere in the classroom. And B, bringing humor, laughter, and smile. And pleasant and calm means that both you and your student are feeling okay no or just little stress and overall good mood secure means that your student feels safe to learn new things make mistakes without being criticized or overly corrected uh, they also rely on you to maintain order and discipline during the lesson as well as keep up with the timing of the lesson and the coverage of uh, the material and i'm gonna leave b to you guys what are your ways to bring in um, a, a ways of bringing in laughter and smile in the lesson? Share your tips. What do you do? Do you use facial expressions? Do you use manicam? Do you do something else? Tell us in the chat. What do you do to bring in humor, laughter, and smile in the lesson? Uh, manicam was my go-to, especially the distortion effect. Ah. <laughs> Lloyd says, crack a joke. Jokes, yeah. Maria says, to cheer. Mm. Just be natural, says Gerald. Uh, Gerald. Right. Rowena says, use Manicam to make face bigger. Oh, sorry. Mm. Who else? Mm -hmm. Nice tips. Yeah. Anyways, thank you very much for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. It's great to see that your classes are... Um, filled with laughter and humor and you know how to uh, yeah how to make fantastic classroom at atmosphere good and last but not least is the teacher meaning yourselves and stay attentive here guys be careful uh, be careful because I'm gonna announce the instructions for the contents con contest um, you can see three tips here a b and c and five gapped words those of you who guess who guess all five words in one message correctly uh will win something we will be in touch with you later but then who you are 
come on and guess in the chat box one message all five words and while you're guessing guys i'm gonna read them out um so some t- some tips for you to increase student engagement is show a good example by being something and something try to behave something and be as something and something as you can so i'm curious do we have anybody who's guessing Remember, it's going to be, it should be one message. All five words in one message. Um, The gaps, the number of gaps is the number of letters missing. This is your hint. Ooh, I think we have one. Is it Charvi? Committed, motivated, naturally sensitive, and assisting. Ooh, uh, almost landed. Yes. Almost. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. I think um, the last one is pretty difficult to guess. I think I know the winner. Yes, we got the winner. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say who, who it is. Um, but what I can see the winner, and yeah, right answers are show a good example by being committed and motivated, try to behave naturally, and be as sensitive and accepting as you can. And apparently, a huge part of the lesson depends on the teacher, uh, your personality, approach to lesson teaching, um, attitude, professionalism, and more. Um, you can be your student's best motivator and um, inspiration or the worst nightmare being committed means that your focus and attention are 100 on your student and the lesson avoiding and eliminating any distractions by being motivated and committed you set an example to your learner um, you encourage them to be committed to if you're 100 focused then your student will be so too And although teaching can be demanding and more difficult from one day to another, and although you're meant to remain professional in any situation, there's nothing wrong with behaving naturally. You don't have to seem overly happy 100% of the time. It's not possible. Behaving naturally and still remaining a professional is a balance every teacher needs to master. On the other hand, your student uh, might not be at their best today. It is important that in such situations, you're accepting and understanding. Behaving naturally, being sensitive and accepting goes both ways and should be true both for you and um, your student, right? So thank you very much, guys, for your um, replies and for your participation. And now I'm going to wrap this uh, theoretical part and hand this over to Dart, who's going to talk about gamification and how to make uh, games from activities and engage your learner even more. Over to you, guys, uh, Dart. Thanks, Sabina. All right. Hi, guys. It's, uh, it's me, Darth, again. And um, it's good to see you. Good to be part of another webinar. So, um, Quick introduction. Yes, my name is Darth. That's my real name. And I've worked with Nova Kid for five years, and I am also a gamer. Right. I've been uh, playing computer games since I was like five years old. And talking about games, what games do you guys play? And tell us what makes them fun. It can be on PC, phone, board games, or sports, right? So drop us your favorite games and what makes them fun in the chat. How about you, Sabina? What's your favorite game? Um, actually, I'm a keen, um, what boy we call them, mobile device games, mobile games player. Mobile games, yeah. <laughs> yeah, guilty. Right. So um, we have Christina playing Valorant. That's great. I play that too. Oh, playing Bring Me Game, Tic-Tac-Toe. Right, fun games, easy to play. 
We have COD, Mobile Legends, Missing Letter Games. Fill in the blanks. Hide and Seek, Super Mario. That is a lot of games. And I'm low-key trying to get together some Nova Kid teachers who play computer games, right? So I think that would be fun. Anyway, so thank you guys for your answers. Those are a lot of games. So it's probably the same for your students, right? I'm sure you've heard your students say, oh, teacher, I play Fortnite, Brawl Stars, right? Pokemon, Among Us, and so on. So as a gamer, I took the liberty of playing most of these games, and I'm here to tell you what makes them fun and how can we, you know, how we can em emulate them in our Nova Kid classes, right? So, but first, let's talk about what makes a game a game, right? And here. So, the anatomy of a game. It's pretty simple, actually. It consists of two things, the challenge and the reward. So, challenges can range from getting more points to defeating an opponent or completing a task. The reward can be, you know, stars, trophies, medals, and even just bragging rights. So the student does something and you give something to the student. Pretty simple. Now, let's take a look at an example of a game. Let's have a role play. All right, Sabina is my student. Okay, Sabina. Circle red. Mm hmm Circle blue. Try again. Try again. Very good. Okay. <laughs> right, let's break it down. Was there a challenge? Hmm. I asked the student to identify the colors, right? That's a challenge. Yep. Were there praises and rewards? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I said very good. Uh, that's a praise, right? <laughs> but did it feel like a game? Not really, right? So what was missing, right? There was a challenge, there was a reward. So what do you think is the key ingredient? Hmm. Now, let's go to the next. So it's pretty simple to turn, you know, simple slides into games, but there are two things that are frequently overlooked. And these are what I call game feel and difficulty. And we're going to talk about them and how they affect the games that you play in your classes. So let's start with game feel. Right. So this is something mostly abstract and can be difficult to uh, you know, quantify. But students and teachers can immediately feel if it is missing. The earlier example was a game, but it didn't feel like it. So what should a good game feel? like. Next slide. So a good game is responsive, right? It should react to your actions no matter how small and feedback should be immediate, right? In games like, you know, Fortnite, when you click the mouse, your fire weapons immediately it sounds crispy, right? When you press the arrow keys in games like, you know, Among Us, your character moves immediately, right? And accurately. When you uh, get to the flagpole in Mario, music plays, confirming that you have completed or finished the level. So it's like Newton's third law of motion, right? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In the example earlier, what did the teacher do when the student got the first correct answer? <sighs> what? Nothing. <laughs> All right, let's see. Pray. First correct answer. All right. <laughs> so
So, a praise. No praise. Right? The teacher didn't say anything. Just moved on to, you know, making the student circle blue. Right? What did I do? Yeah, no reaction. Right? So, what would you have done? Right? After getting a correct answer. How about you, Sabina? What would you have done? Uh, the, the most obvious is letting my student know that this is the right answer. So well done. Yep. Right. So uh, Lovely says uh, facial expression is, is effective. Yep, it is. Carla says to clap. Right. Christine says make your eyes bigger and smile. Smile, yep. Make your eyes bigger. Right. You can Have in mind the overpraising thing. <laughs> right. Paul says, do a Zoom reaction. Right. Okay. Good answers. Yeah, to praise and reward. Really. Next um, question is, what did the teacher do when the student struggled? Right. Sabina struggled to you know, find the correct color. You were hot to circle. To me. To. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> None. Try again. Uh, right. So, what would you have done differently? How about you, Sabina? When you struggled, what would what would I have done? <laughs> you probably let your student know. This is the wrong answer. And maybe give some hints. Mm hmm. Right. You react to it, right? Mm hmm. English with Queen says, "Give her time. Don't rush her. I shouldn't have rushed you." Right. 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 Mm hmm. Sound effects says Lois. Mm hmm. Ooh, a buzzer goes off. Says Paul, like, Arrgh. right. <laughs> that that can sound um, sound gamey, right? Okay, what did the teacher do when the student made a mistake? Right. Hmm. No, I just said try again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I was very cold. I'm sorry, Sabina. No, it's, it's fine uh, with you giving me more <laughs> chances. It's just, I mean, when somebody makes mistakes and looks at teacher's face and teacher's like, you look, okay. <laughs> just, uh. <laughs> right. Thank you for your answers, teachers. All right. So a quick note, the responses that you give should encourage the behavior you want. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think we have time. Here's an interesting trivia for you guys uh, there is a game called world of warcraft right it's a role-playing game where you uh, defeat monsters to gain experience points and use those points to level up now role-playing games uh, can be notorious for burning uh, players out right especially if they play for long periods of time so to discourage players from playing for too long the developers added a system where the longer you play the less experience points you get this did not go well, right? The players were angry. They didn't like it. They felt like they were being punished. So the developers flipped the system and instead introduced a rest bonus. So when the players log off from the game, they gain a rest bonus. And the longer they rest, the bigger the bonus they get. So when they log back in after that long rest, they uh, the that can be used to boost the experience points they get from defeating monsters. And the players were happy. The thing is, it's the same numbers, but different implementations. Long story short, the lesson is to encourage the behavior you want instead of punishing the behavior you don't, right? So a good game should be responsive. <laughs> All right, now let's continue. And let's get to another aspect of uh, what makes a good game a good game is a good game is dynamic. 
right? It should keep things fresh and interesting to keep the students motivated. In games like Super Mario, you get different power-ups from eating different things like a mushroom to be bigger, the ability to throw fireballs, and even the ability to fly. Candy Crush introduces uh, new candies that break the surrounding ones, candies that take out entire colors, and even ones that spawn fishes, right? And just like in your games, you can make things you know, fresh by switching things up, like the rewards, changing the intensity of your praises, or adding variety to your activities. Um, we saw one teacher gave out uh, stickers as a reward, right? The teacher had stickers for every cartoon character known to man. We saw another teacher use the pen tool as a reward since the student likes to draw. So the teacher bribes the student with pen tool time for giving correct answers and following instructions. The intensity part uh, mainly involves uh, making your praises more interesting and more fun the more the student struggled. When the student completes easy tasks, the rewards and praises are eh, normal. But when the student overcomes a difficult activity, like finally being able to pronounce the word singer as singer instead of singer, right? You hype up the praises and the rewards, make them sound like celebratory, like woo, <laughs> right? So it's like, it's like this, like this is your student's motivation in class. The student encounters a difficult task and struggles. The motivation tank slowly depletes. So you need to juice it up by giving awesome praises and rewards and keep it there, right? Being dynamic is not just uh, for praises and rewards, but also how you execute the activities. Like, oh, you want to test the student's ability to identify the colors? You can do a bring me game. You can show fun things like toys and have the student identify the colors. Uh, oh, you want the student to practice you know, collocations? You can do actions and have the student identify them and then switch roles. As long as the objectives are met, you can make things fun. So how about you? How do you switch things up? Hmm. What do you do to keep things you know, dynamic? Let us know in the chat. And while <laughs> our teachers are typing, can I, can I just say that, that I love the motivation tank metaphor? It's just so true. How did you come mm -hmm. up with that? Games. <laughs> it's like in every game, there's like a, something that you need to fill in or to keep filled. Uh, right. <laughs> Hmm, let's see what the teachers say. The student should feel exciting to play, right? Play the game, not be confused, right? Uh, referring back to Sabina's uh, clear instructions earlier. Mm -hmm. Pop their favorite character with Manicam. That's fine, mm, right? A teacher versus student challenge. Ooh, I bet your students would love to see you lose. <laughs> All right. Interesting ideas, teachers. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll steal your ideas for the next webinar. All right, so let's move on to the next, which is difficulty, All right? So a good game's difficulty should match the student's skills, All right? Do you notice in games like Pac-Man, Candy Crush, and Super Mario that the longer you play the game, the more difficult it becomes? When you play these games for the first time, you always start off easy, right? Then gradually move on to harder levels. In Candy Crush, you can find five candies in a row and make combos, right, easily. But get painfully difficult as the game goes on. It really encourages you to buy power-ups. Right? But not just in video games, right? In board games like Scrabble, it becomes more challenging to come up with words as you know the game, the board, is littered with other words that you need to append. Right? You have fewer spaces to work with. Um, the same goes for the games that you play in your classes. You need to make sure that you do not go too hard. It's safer to go easy than ramp up the difficulty than to go too hard and have to you know, bring down the difficulty. Think about a graph. 
right? Like here we have uh, the difficulty and we here we have the lesson. So we should create a smooth curve, right? This allows the student to keep up and it creates a pleasant learning environment. Um, in learning about colors, for example, right? Here's an example, we learn about colors. Making the student repeat after you is easier than making the student circle the color, which is easier than making the student respond with yes or no, which is easier than making the student identify the colors and you know so on. So as you can see, there's this hierarchy of activities from easiest to the hardest. And what you want to do is to start at something relatively easy. This allows the student to build momentum and helps the student complete the task, which gives you the opportunity to give rewards. The student gets motivated and the cycle continues. On the other hand, going from making the student simply repeat after you to immediately making the student you know, make sentences on her own, it creates a difficulty spike. It's when the difficulty suddenly goes up now, the question is, what do you think will happen? What do you think happens when there are difficulty spikes? Hmm? When no, it's not a smooth just, curve. Can I just quickly <laughs> interrupt you? And while our teachers are thinking, uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. I'm just going to say that we're going to take about 10 or 15 minute, minutes more because we can see a lot of questions coming from you guys. If those of you who need to leave uh, feel free to do that. Uh, well, you, we're gonna you're gonna receive a recording as usually, uh, and please fill in our feedback form, uh, which is in the chat. We're gonna be really grateful. So sorry for interrupting you, Dot. And yeah, back to the question about difficulty spike. Hmm. What are they going to say? Lovely says it demotivates a student. Yep. We have um, Paul says the student can't manage the change. Yeah. yeah, can be. It suddenly becomes too difficult, right? They are discouraged. Hmm. They feel frustrated. Mm hmm. Right. Hmm. What else? I think that's it. Yep. Hmm. The student will participate less. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> student will change the teacher. Ugh, hope not. All right. Yes. All right. So the bottom line is create smooth difficulty curve instead of creating difficulty spikes. All right. All right. Hmm. And lastly, speaking of games, what are your go-to games that you play in your classes? Right, something that will always land. Is it a, a bring me game? Tic tac toe on a blank slide, <laughs> or uh, hmm, many camp stickers. Tic tac toe. Hmm. Bring me. Boys versus girls. I huh, wonder what that's about. <laughs> Tic-tac-toe variants and twists. Ooh, making the tic-tac-toe game dynamic. Mm -hmm. All right. I'd love to see that, honestly. Wow, these are awesome games. And again, we are going to steal them for the next webinar. All right. So, Savina, uh, what do you have in store for us? Uh, actually, I have some interesting announcements to make but first i'm gonna say thank you very much dot for this useful part i had a lot of fun i didn't know there were so many games and that yeah fantastic um i'm just gonna say guys that the next coming is the our q a session and i already see some questions coming uh, if you didn't post your question and you have one please post your question now in the chat box. While you're on it, I'm just going to quickly say that um, in, in the framework of our 4-in-1 project, which includes 
webinars, Ask Your Mentor program, Nova Kefi, and the Teacher Portal articles. We will continue discussing student engagement this month. Stay tuned. Look forward to our updates. Come to other meetings uh, that will take place during the, the next three weeks, and you'll be able to discuss more in, in a more detailed way some, some of your questions, concerns, share your experience, learn more about the topic from other teachers, and of course, meet new people. Um, we, we'll keep you informed as usually. Um, register and join us. And yeah, we're looking forward to um, our superstars and uh, uh, seeing your faces. And yep. Yeah. Now, uh, shall we proceed to the questions? questions? I think this one is for you. Mary asks, Miss, Miss Abina, in your perspective as an assessor, which is the most important for you? Question is about independence tips. Hmm. Let me go back to one to my slide about independence tips and uh, oh. I'm going to share it with you guys so you see that as well um there is no direct oh here here it is yeah there's no as you know no direct criteria in our assessment form um about any of these however we do take um all of these into consideration when um observing a lesson first of all um Feeding the answers and wait time affects directly your student talk time share. Uh, encouraging ideas, encouraging questions, again, directly affects your teacher talk time and student talk time, right? So the more your student asks questions, the more they provide ideas, uh, the more you keep silent, the better for your um, assessment, basically. Um, yeah, this is, I hopefully I've asked, I've answered the question. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have <laughs> anything else in store? So we have um, Roxanne asks, um, what if the student loves sharing a lot of her ideas on every slide to the extent that we can't discuss all major concepts due to time constraint? How do you handle such a student? I think this, this is, is a question uh, for you, Dart a high level student, right? Being able to share, right? So um, what you can do is you can try to steer the conversation back into the topic by asking questions, right? Let's say the topic is about, what do you think? Telecommunications? Mm -hmm. And then a student likes to talk about, oh, I like to play games on your phone, there, there. And then you try to ask questions like, hmm, how about people before we didn't have phones what do you think the games that they play and then you try to ask more questions to you know keep her back to the topic right you can also uh coax the student into like a soft landing like right right and then at that moment that you know that room that dead air ask the question the thing about these uh, students who like to share is that they like to when there's a, a dead air, there's that space in between the, um, the back and forth, they like to talk. So you try to ask questions to lead them back to the topic. All right. Hope that helps. We have um, Henry Hancox. Some parents sit there and give them all the answers. How do I tell the parent to not do that nicely? It's like, oh, my God. Um... Can I just say, Dart, that just tell them, just be direct, be polite, uh, but tell them uh, what they should should be doing at the moment and why. E explain uh, your reasons and why you think they should not be helping uh, their child. Uh, being straightforward helps. Mm -hmm. but Dart, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, that. That, that works when the student can also, you know, communicate with you, can speak in English. Um, in cases where it's just the student or, and the parent and they cannot 
communicate in English, there's a reason behind why parents try to answer for the student. It's because they don't want the student to struggle. So what you can do is you can transition from presentation, like practicing answering, to making the student answer on their own. Like you want to make that smooth transition because during practice, it's just you and the student, right? Repeat after me, easy answers. And what I discussed earlier is you try to have a series of activities that will allow the student to transition from being you as the support to just on his own, right? So that is a sign that you have created a really good um, difficulty curve in your activities. Right, so that works. This is what I was, uh, was going to say. Difficulty spike was not a spike, but rather a curve, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. So um, we have Roxanne. Well, another one from Roxanne. How do you create new rewards for regular students who already have 100 plus lessons? Wow. So they won't get bored of repetitive rewards. Hmm. Wow, I wonder what rewards you can create. Hmm. So 100 plus lessons with you, that means that, yeah, probably at level four, I guess. Yeah, this, so, is, this is what I'm, what I, sorry for interrupting. This is what I saw. Um, if they started with you like several levels ago, they're probably older now, so maybe we should reconsider the rewards that we use for. Maybe we used some rewards when they were five and now they're six, or when they, we used six and now they're seven. So maybe rewards for older kids? What do you think? Mm -hmm. um, more mature students or high level students don't really you know, ac not accept, but you know, work well with stars and toys and stickers anymore. They thrive more on praises. Like when, not, not your very good job. No, not praises. That be you being more um, impressed at the students' uh, ideas, how they formulate the sentences, and attention. Right? If you if you act interested, they're more inclined to talk. They're more inclined to do the activities. Right? So. Make your rewards dynamic, right? For lower level students, stars and more fun things. For more mature ones, there. All right. Sounds challenging, but really, I think it's really worth it. And maybe the last question, then we'll finish. Uh, from Roxanne, uh, how do you create? Oh, okay, this was the one, right? That we just learned. But I, I actually oh, yeah. <laughs> I saw a question about fruit. Um, somebody asked. What if the whole lesson is about fruits and they don't like fruits? And I'm just gonna say, Dart, is it isn't it the case that you were talking about about games? You can basically make the lesson into a game, and yeah, yeah. Um, there are some instances like uh, an example would be about comparative and superlative adjectives, right? Planets may not be interesting to some. So you can still carry that main objective about comparative and superlatives and apply it, you know, try apply a different skin to it, right? Maybe about family, about animals, about things that the students are still are interested in, but still keep the comparative and superlative main objectives, right? Yep, sounds sounds great. And I think we can wrap things up. Uh, and I'm just going to say thank you to those of you who've been with us during this hour and uh, much more thanks to those of you who stayed with us till the end. Thank you very much, Dart, for being uh, my fabulous companion tonight uh, at this webinar. Hopefully awesome. it's been useful. And yeah, see you next time, guys. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.